640,000 people alone will get a disease from a CPAP this year. That's actually in the United States alone. So worldwide, that number could easily get to a million per year. And I'm not just saying stuff. I'll show you the exact mechanism and the research behind everything here. The point is we need to always weigh the risk of different things that we're pursuing especially given the history of modern medicine. And honestly, these are just examples from the last 10 years, whether we're talking about people going antidepressants and now they have something else to be depressed about. For example, antidepressants can take away intimacy and probably make you more depressed or opioids reducing pain, but then leading to addiction or something like a little bit less obvious, like taking a proton pump inhibitor for acid reflux. And now guess what? You've increased your risk for osteoporosis or probably one of the biggest ones, statins, because, you know, got a lower cholesterol, that number's going to get you. But then that causes different issues like brain fog and weakness here. So there's always a trade-off. But the thing is, you need to be able to weigh what that trade-off is in informed consent, which is just simply like what I just did for you to hear, being able to tell you what the risk involved are. So you and your doctor can make a good decision together. Now for sleep apnea, that doesn't really exist. It's not this very balanced conversation. Instead, it's pretty much use this device or you will die. And then you end up with a crutch. But as we'll talk about today, using this could take you from relying on crutches to being in a wheelchair figuratively. All right, it's an analogy. So in this episode, we'll cover the most common disease that a CPAP causes and what may reduce this risk. Of course, this is for educational purposes only. This is Peter, the educational purpose porpoise. And always talk to your doctor before making any changes. This is not medical advice. So some basic physiology for us to build a foundation on how obstructive sleep apnea happens and then how this disease emerges from CPAP treatment. So sleep apnea is going to happen because you got like weak floppy muscles, most commonly FTS, floppy tongue syndrome. That's not a real acronym, but if you do want to sound cool, you could use that. You have these weak muscles, and then at night, as you inhale, it pulls those muscles together, or even soft tissue, connective tissue, pulls that together, and that closes off your airway. Think of it like a door. You can have a door kind of cracked open a little bit, and then if a strong breeze or wind goes by, it can actually close that door. So the door is... The, the tissue we talked about, right? Muscles, other stuff. And the breeze that shuts it is that fast or regular inhale. Okay, a little bit faster above baseline. Thus, being able to, you know, slow down your inhale and all that is going to be able to be very paramount. We'll talk about that. But more importantly, is what tells your body to breathe a little bit faster or even a little bit slower? Either way, because we talked about both. So what you need to know, and this is critical to understand the emergence of this disease. The amount of CO2 in your body and also oxygen drive your brain to tell your diaphragm how to expand. In other words, CO2 and oxygen tell your brain to tell your body how much to breathe or how fast to breathe. Now, if you want to guess which one's more important, I know this isn't live, but you can guess below if you like learning and stuff. But the whole idea is that CO2 is actually the bigger driver of your brain getting that signal, hey, we should breathe. We should do something about this. Oxygen is a less important. It can still contribute and still does. But CO2 is far more important. So the other way to say this is that CO2 levels control breathing at the level of the brain. For instance, say these are CO2 molecules. Here's three of them, arbitrary numbers and units, my favorite thing. If you have three, you get this signal, breathe. Okay, in case you forgot what breathing was, I decided to demonstrate it for you. However, if we use something that created a breeze or excess movement of air that would blow away some of the CO2 molecules. So if we zoom out a little bit, we blow away these two CO2 molecules, and then we get a way smaller signal to breathe. Just breathe. bottom line, less CO2 because you have something. So if you have something like a CPAP that leads to blowing CO2 molecules away or overventilating you, you will have a reduced signal to breathe. And that's exactly where this disease comes from. All right. It's a type of central apnea. All right. I'll give you the full term in a little bit. 
But what happens is that you lose the drive to breathe and then you end up with central apneas. So the bottom line is you have obstructive sleep apnea, right? You know, your, your crap sandwich of sleep. I'm gonna keep that in the video because that's just <laughs> great wording. And then you add another slice of something else bad on top that is central sleep apnea. So you have obstructive sleep apnea and then you pile central sleep apnea on top of it. This specifically associated with CPAP use is known as treatment emergent central sleep apnea. If you want to sound really cool, you can say TEXA, but no one actually says that and uh, you'll just infuse more people um, like I do on a daily basis. So TEXA, see, not really that clear, but treatment emergent central sleep apnea is a really big thing. So here's a paper. If you want to check it out, I recommend you do. And this is a type of study where they don't just like bring 20 people into a lab and see what happens. It took nine studies, like all of them having anywhere from like, you know, 50, 100 plus in those studies and like combined all the data to see what is the true picture of if you have 100 people who start with a CPAP, how many of them get this? So what they found was a range, 5% to 20%. And I just picked 8% as what I think might be the, the true average. I didn't like do a precise calculation. This is just my very conservative and friendly uh, percentage that we're using here because we'll do some calculations. So 8% of people who use a CPAP, chances are they will get central sleep apnea. So one out of every 12 people that is handed a CPAP in the office will get this. That's pretty astronomical. I'll tell you why that's so bad. I know it. It probably intuitively is bad. Like, oh, I already had one app. Now I got two app. It's great. So how many people is this impacting? So apparently online, you can buy nearly $5,000 reports about the sleep apnea devices market. I like, I like, I wonder if you buy this, it has to come with like dinner or something, dinner and a movie, at least like what is in there for $5,000. Anyway, and one thing they cover and have on the page for free, thank God is how many people use a CPAP in the United States. All right, if we just do some math or maths, I guess, I forget how you do that. 8 million times 8%, 640,000 people in the US every year getting this. Not good. Now it gets even crazier. We'll talk about the damage from that. But, you know, if you look up the, the treatment algorithms online, this kind of shocked me. So if you have OSA and then you end up getting good old Texa, you can laugh about it. Guess what? Just keep on doing things. Or if things continue to get worse, let's put you up to a BiPAP. The BiPAP is perhaps twice as annoying as a CPAP because it's uh, blowing air or controlling the airflow rather during both inhaling and exhaling. A lot of people report massive discomfort with using a BiPAP. So pretty much it is this analogy of going from like, you know, crutches like a CPAP to, hey, let's get you something that pretty much does it for you and takes away your body's own natural ability to do it for you, you know, with the wheelchair analogy here, which is why I think like when I see this, I'm like, so we, so we have something that caused the problem. So we're going to provide the solution as a more powerful version of the initial thing. And that's why I feel like I'm going crazy because what I have not expressed yet is what this means. Yes, analogies are cool, but effectively, let's say if you're just on a CPAP level and you don't have treatment induced central sleep apnea, you may do things in your life. Maybe you lose some weight. Maybe you change your diet. Maybe you uh, do breathing exercises. Maybe you do myofunctional. Maybe you just sleep on your side, right? And those things enough, or mouth guard, or mouth tape. There's a lot of things. Maybe you do that, and your obstructive sleep apnea is not as problematic as it used to be. And maybe, under your doctor's good wishes, you don't need a CPAP anymore. It's a temporary thing. However, there's a 1 in 12 chance, which is the conservative estimate, that you will end up with central sleep apnea, and therefore, be someone who you could do all those things, 
but you would still have to rely on a CPAP. Because for central sleep apnea, there's, there's things you can do, but it's very limited in comparison to obstructive sleep apnea. So it pretty much has you trying something out and you're stuck on it pretty much for life. Not ideal, not ideal at all. So that's why I wanna talk about some ways to reduce your risk of this, right? And then once again, this is for educational purposes only. Always speak with your doctor before making any changes. And I wanna talk about two things, again, that you can bring to a conversation with your licensed healthcare provider of if you're using a CPAP, with CPAP, and without CPAP. Now for CPAP, it's actually pretty simple. This is actually a pretty simple fix, which it is mind boggling to me that there's really nothing done about this. But there's some simple add-ons. Number one is a hypercapnic rebreather, which sounds like something that would be packaged together with a plux capacitor, however it's not, or a dead space edition, which sounds, that sounds like some like, you know, renovation thing. Or you get a dead space edition, which sounds just as attractive as a in-law suite. Uh, I'm joking. I love my mother-in-law very much. She made me a great shirt if you haven't seen it. It's the one with the, like the purple collar. Now this is something that was discovered long, long ago before the internet, 1985, that if you utilize a hypercapnic rebreather or a dead space, this will virtually eliminate apneas and hypopneas from people and prevent central sleep apnea from developing. And they're actually pretty simple in terms of setup where you either add a little uh, bag here or would be added. Like I'm not, do not like get some duct tape in a, Ziploc bag and apply it to your CPAP mask. Okay, do not do that because you watch YouTube, <laughs> all right? Uh, these are like things you would attach to the mask as they're provided by the manufacturer, all right? And then a dead space is just, uh, I mean, just like extra space here. That's the whole point of it. It doesn't contract or expand, uh, doesn't ventilate a whole lot. It's just extra dead space. Regardless, they lead to the same outcome of raising CO2 levels a little bit, so we avoid that scenario I showed you earlier. All right, where is our... You're getting dizzy from this, I am too. So it helps us keep some of these CO2 molecules instead of just blowing them off and not having them for what we need. That is the end impact from them. Now, these are things you can legitimately ask your doctor or respiratory therapist or nurse, whoever is managing your mask and get these items. Now, they're not very common, uh, not a lot of people know how to use them or are familiar with them, I should say, rather. They're pretty simple, just attach on. Uh, but the question may be, why are these not, like, given out? Because if 1 in 12 people is going to run the risk of getting a pretty bad secondary disease from treatment, you know, one, they're not FDA approved, which isn't the golden thing you would think it is. But... The bigger meaning of that is that insurance will not cover it because insurance companies look to the FDA and say, hey, what should we, uh, you know, we're only going to use 1% of our uh, customers' money to help them, but what should, what should we do with it? I'm sure there's no conflict of interest there. Um, and that's how they base what they pay for. And thus... What insurance will pay for is what doctors will practice. Not because they're insurance institutes, but because that's just the limitation of being in the field. Like a lot of times when you're in a clinic, you're asking yourself like, well, does their insurance cover this or that? It's an unfortunate condition of medicine, at least in the United States, probably elsewhere too. That's why these things aren't really ever talked about. But however, you, you could spark that inquiry. Um, and I'm sure they're available for purchase. Well, I guess they're medical devices, so perhaps not. Now, for the second category, non-CPAP related ways, which you could still utilize these if you are using a CPAP, because these will help with CO2 and how your brain you know, talks to CO2 and your body how to breathe. Uh, so available for everyone. So as you'll notice, this is like the exact same thing as above but just doing it a different way. So this picture here of Bane is dead spacing, where you're breathing with a mask, et cetera. I wouldn't really recommend this. Um, really just here for, I guess, academic reasons. But the bigger one is 
rebreathing. So rebreathing is just breathing in more CO2 in a way from your own breath. And it's been shown that breath holding is a way that you increase CO2 or, you know, kind of rebreathe it. And that can impact something known as loop gain, which is how your brain senses CO2. So if you're able to retrain that, then you can respond appropriately, right? So if we talk about this state here, this is when your body is sensing CO2 incorrectly. But if we retrain it with increasing your exposure to CO2 through rebreathing or slow breathing, then it will reprogram your brain to respond more appropriately. So you go from this fast or regular inhale that pulls things together, the, those weak muscles, to a slower, steadier one. All right, that's very, very important here. Now, there's a lot of different ways to do it. One way is, is very, very simple, box breathing. Because when we think about it, maybe you take 10 breaths per minute, probably more like 15, that's every six seconds. If you do box breathing, you will end up taking a breath every 16 seconds, that's four times per minute, AKA 25% of what you normally do. Big reduction downward. That's the whole idea. And it can be done with like four in, hold, four out, hold, and just repeat that cycle. That's just one way of retraining, rebreathing. But one of the biggest things that I don't talk about this enough, so there's this principle that the said principle, okay? This is usually more around weightlifting. So for instance, if you squat every day, those are your imposed demands. You will adapt. But just because you started to get good at lifting or squatting 100 pounds, now that's no longer demanding on you. That's easy. So you will stop adapting. So you do 110 pounds and you just do that, so on and so forth. That's what the said principle is. It also applies to these breathing exercises where your body will adapt and then you need to adapt your strategy, which could be increasing the hold or increasing the exhale, right? That's how you make the most progress with retraining the rebreathing aspect so that you're breathing a whole lot better and very likely as a result, sleeping a whole lot better. So you could apply that for yourself. You totally could. Another option is letting us do that for you. So we got the PECUS breathing program here where you get a lot of great things where we figure out, hey, what are the specific things that you need to work on? And what are those imposed demands that we can make happen? In other words, being able to see where you're at with your breathing and then give you a very specific and easy step-by-step -step plan that you follow and making it even easier because that's what this is all about. You just press play on some audio tracks, you follow along, and that's pretty much it. Like 10, 20 minutes per day, all you need. And as you do that, just like with working out, uh, it's nice to have someone there, make sure things are going well. So that's where you also get direct access to me. We have our live group Q&A calls. For any questions you have, you can speak to me directly there and we can get things sorted out around your breathing. So if you wanna learn more about that, you can go to ochnow.com forward slash program. Uh, you can go to that link directly, or the link will also be in the description below. And sometimes there's a button that I remember to put on the screen here. All right, everyone. So thank you so much for watching, Dylan Pekas, and I'll see you soon.